cells into life. Within cells into life. Within one stem. Within one stem. And dreadfully distinct. And dreadfully distinct. Against the dark. Against the dark. A tall white fountain plate. A tall white fountain plate. All the stories in the Bible are really just telling one single story. Obviously it's one book, but I finally understood what that means. I'm saying on a, on a repetition level that it's revealing the same structure over and over again. And I, I, like I said, that's something I've heard from scholars before, but I'm reading the Bible for the first time through and through right now. And it's never become clear. And the idea that there's all these connections that we've through and through that are revealing this pattern, this pattern that finally comes to a conclusion with Christ, um, it's obvious once you get it. And like, I'm not saying I get the whole thing because like every day I wake up and I'm seeing more and more. But once you latch onto it and you see the story it's telling, it's incredible. It's absolutely incredible. And so I'm going to try and share that today. All right, so let's start with the story of Jacob. Now, Jacob's family, they go to a new town, and one of the men there, one of his sons, uh, wants Jacob's daughter, and he defiles her. They have sex before marriage, which is a big, big no-no. Now, the family squabble, and they kind of try and make right with it, and they come to some sort of an agreement, but two of Jacob's sons are not happy with the agreement. And so after the next day, they go and slaughter everyone in the whole place. And it says that the fear of God is on the, the cities around them. And that's what allows them to escape without, 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 without dying. Um, in this pattern, we see a repeat of something that's in Sodom and Gomorrah, a more familiar story and a more heavenly story, as in it's higher and it can see more. It reveals more of the other ones. And the, the fact that everyone knows what it is already kind of says that it's, it's somewhat higher in this hierarchy of, of heavenly revelation. Um, in Sodom and Gomorrah, there are two angels, and they're staying with Abraham's kid, Lot. And the city folk come, and they want them angels, and they want to defile them. Now, because these angels are completely pure, the story plays out a little differently. As in, in the story of Jacob, the whole family will need to go um, and, uh, and do a purification ritual after the sins that their, that their sons committed. The angels don't have that. They have more conviction, because again... They are pure beings of light and sight. So when the angels lay waste the city, it is God doing it. And one of the reasons why there's there's two, um, two angels and two brothers, it's the idea that when people are in dialogue, they're in an active process of purification, of, of learning what about themselves is wrong and ending pathological cycles. Because when you're alone and you talk to yourself, you fall in whatever sinful directions make up you. And so you need two people to support the face of God. And two or more in thy name, Christ is there also. Now, in the case of Sodom and Gomorrah, when it is literally essentially God destroying the city, you need two pure angels to hold that up. Two things that have no pathologies in them because God is that pure. Um, so it's, a, it's like I said, it's a more heavenly story. And we see this pattern of violence and sin leading to a flood, again, in, in, the, in Noah's flood, um, where... From the violence that Cain caused, it caused a cycle of death and destruction that spiraled up out of control from technology um, and using materialism, a, a low-level materialism, um, to make warfare worse and worse and worse and worse. And so God purifies the whole earth. And we can see a little bit what purification is through that. It's bathing. It's, 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 a, it's a way of removing dirt. Um, and you can also also think that in very um, you can also see that in very direct terms in that when you're taking a bath um, you could be washing off your your brother's blood or the dirt that came from you crawling in the dirt from uh, you know doing some military action or it could be the strange fluids that seem to appear after desiring after a woman we can see this cycle of violence idea expressed again in the story of Judah um, where basically what happens with Judah is that his brother is chosen by God to lead over him and over his family. And Judah's not very happy with that. And so him and his other brothers conspire to get rid of Joseph. And, well, that ends up not working out in the end. Joseph ends up being just fine, let's say. But what happens to Judah is that his son, his firstborn son, ends up being pure evil. Because he is born out of a person who's, who's exhibiting psychopathic ten tendencies. And psychopathology and cancer really have the same definition technically. It's a small self that's not integrated within the rest of the large system. That's actually a te technical definition of what a cancer is. 
And what these systems do is at the end, they always eat themselves and they always die. And so his first son, Ur, that's a fun name, Ur, dies. And he's left a widow. And the woman, Tamar, still wants to have a kid. And Judah decides to marry one of his other sons, Onan, to her. But Onan refuses to do that because he sees that as giving a seed to his brother. And this is a selfish family. And so he takes it in for himself and says no. And again, this is cancerous behavior and God smites him and he dies. And what ends up ending this situation, or I shouldn't even say end, what stops a flood in this situation, it's not necessarily a flood, is that they become lower, they become more animalistic. Now, what do I mean by that? Judah wants to have sex still, and so he goes after a prostitute. And Tamar still wants to procreate and have children. So she dresses up like a prostitute and tricks Judah into sleeping with her to give her seed. Um, we see this as more animalistic because when humans are engaging in a marriage, it's also something that the whole community and the whole future of the whole nation is thought about in, in a way when it's, when, it's, when it's unified in its highest way. It's about love and relationship and reciprocity. But when all those levels get, get, get removed, it becomes more base and animalistic. It's just about pleasure. It's just about procreation. It's very earthly. And again, we see this idea of moving towards animals, towards earth, away from heaven, as revealing what all this structure is. Um, and to go back to that, what's even closer than an animal? The lowest animal. It's a snake. Okay? And so we're going to go to Genesis <laughs> back again. The snake represents the lowest perspective you can have. He's almost like uh, a materialist in some way where he's sure of everything. And so he tells them, you can know good and evil and be like God. Everyone forgets the be like God part because that's actually very important. Because we see that desire and that to know everything and to know good and evil. That ends up spiraling up in the story of Babel, where they say we can know like God, we can be like God, we are God, and it falls, and it ends. And if you understand that further, see Noah Yuval Harari's Homo Deus, and that's what's going to happen, by the way, and that's going to be fun for all of us. But again, there's actually an a interesting perspective to draw from this, and that is what makes a human is not has nothing to do with intelligence and more everything to do with morality. And there's even something to understand that intelligence is somewhat a byproduct of morality in a lot of ways. Um, I don't want to get into that too much, but yes, being very intelligent oftentimes can just be a way to be very cruel in ways that no one can see. So that's why you see a correlation where it seems like being smarter protects you from crime, but no, it protects you from being caught. And honestly, smarter people oftentimes work in more abstract space where it just takes longer and longer times for their sins to unfold. Um, I could keep going a lot. Uh, a lot, a lot. And I will. I'll tell one more. Um, so <laughs> with, with Jacob, um, Jacob deceives his brother. Um... He claims all of his blessings and his birthrights through lies and conspiring with his mom. And because of that, he has to leave because his brother wants to kill him. And he doesn't really get a taste of his own medicine until he meets a man named Laban. And he wants to marry one of his daughters. And Laban tricks him to marrying one of his other daughters. He's like, well, I want to marry the other one. He's like, fine, you can marry them both. And then does a num number of series of tricks to keep him on his land to stop him from leaving. And what Jacob... And what Jacob has to do to correct this is essentially become a master of a lie. And I think what a, what a master of a lie is, is, is using a lie, this is going to sound wrong at first, but towards God's purpose. Because there are sometimes situations that are unwinnable, like Sodom and Gomorrah. You know, if you had to lie to get your way out of the situation, although you might need to cleanse yourself afterwards, I think you would be forgiven. And he does go through purification ritual after this. <laughs> Excuse me. But he promises to make a covenant with Laban. And while Laban calls the place like a special face of God, Jacob calls it um, a pile of rocks. <laughs> he calls it what it is. Um, so that's also kind of funny, uh, where it's like a, a very tricky sort of lie. Um, but again, he does need the purification thing. Now, how do all these stories and these cycles of deceit and people need, needing to use deceit in order to get out of situations, how do those all find their conclusion? Now, if you've talked to a religious person for any time that's long enough, you know if they give you a riddle, it's, the answer is probably Christ. And guess what? That's what the answer is here. Although I don't completely understand it. Who Christ is, 
I'm not quite there yet. Um, but there's something about the fact that he doesn't need to use deceit. He can be his naked self. And that because he's completely pure, that when he dies, he comes back the same in his pure form, just as he was. There is no death or dirt that needs to come off of him. And he's something like a point that, that gives meaning and gives the purpose to all those, to, to all of that. That it, that it shows the final revelation of all that meaning, typified, uniting the most heavenly story with something that's also the most earthly, death, the <laughs> snake. And he's able to integrate the materialist perspective because, because he is God and he can see it all. But yeah, this is something I don't completely understand yet. And so I guess this is probably just where I should just end the video. So if you enjoyed this analysis, pretty much all of the symbolic understanding that I have here is derived from The Symbolic World uh, by Jonathan Pajot. There's a link here in the description of the video. And The Language of Creation by Mathieu Pajot. Um, this book in particular is a really special book. I can't recommend it enough. Um, I'm not finished with it yet, but, you know, reading the chapters, it's really worth just reading one chapter and then meditating on it and thinking about it, maybe going to sleep, because you can tell that there's years work of thinking within every page. The book is very simple, but also incredibly deep. Um, can't recommend it enough. Yeah, I, I wouldn't be able to have done any of this without them because it's, it's because the understanding is borrowed almost directly from them. It, it just hasn't clicked until now. So, anyways, thank you.